Welcome back, Shelligators. I wanna to talk today about a show I don't think we've ever covered, The Crown, The Crown. Maybe we have, because every season there's like one moment, one sort of phrase that stands out to me. And one season it was when Queen Elizabeth was like, non-reaction is the hardest thing in the world. Holding your tongue and being strategic, hardest thing ever. And so there was another moment in this season that I'm gonna tell you about that I think sort of echoes that. But also I wanna talk about how to be the hero in a heated, fraught situation. Before we get into it, a big thank you to a company called Established Titles for sponsoring today's video. Here's just a quick word that ties in oh so well. Oh, hello there. I didn't see you come in, the butler didn't alert me. You might know me as Shallon Exo or whatever they called me in America, but you know, I've had a bit of an upgrade. I recently became a lady. Why, oh, yes, I was gifted a parcel of land in Scotland. And did you know that when you're a landowner in Scotland, you are automatically referred to as a lady? Therefore, I am heretofore known as Lady Shannon Lester of Eddleton, Scotland. And really, I was getting so tired of dealing with peasants and villagers and their silly little customs, although some can be quite wholesome. Was it loathsome? I get the word so often confused. Ma'am, would you like a table at Applebee's? No, I would not. I would like a plot of land in Scotland. And now you can join me. A company called Established Titles will sell you a plot of land in Scotland. One square foot is all you need to become a lord or a lady. Now listen, this is more than just vanity and getting away from people making unwanted eye contact at, what was that place, Applebee's? Yes. It's about conservation. One thing established title does is when you purchase the land, it's now protected. No one's going to build one of those, what do they call it, Walmarts on there. No. And established titles work with global charities, One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future, planting trees on your plot. All the better for the villagers to hide in and stay quite away from me. So. This makes a wonderful gift for yourself or for your peasant friends. And did you know, did you know, you can use your title in everyday application, your LinkedIn profile, your email signature, whatever that is, dating apps, booking airline tickets and reservations, even applying for credit cards. Established Titles is actually running a massive Black Friday sale right now. Plus, if you use code SHALLON, you get an additional 10% off. Can you imagine if heretofore your boss had to call you Lady Caitlin of New Jersey? Ah, oh, fantastic! And the first 200 people to use my special link will get a plot of land right next to mine. Can you imagine? We can finally start our own fiefdom. Shallon land. No, Shalligatoria. What should we call it? I don't know. Revengeverse. Evilverse. We'll workshop it a bit. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have the evening's festivities to attend to. Alistair, will you show our guests out? No, no, not through the West Wing. They're cooking tonight's goose in there. Good help rarely is so hard to find. Let me know if you have any exes who need a job. Okay, and we're back. I know, a lady, right? Ah, oh, could you just die? I love it, I'm, I'm so into it. I will be accepting no further eye contact from here on out. Okay, no direct eye contact, thank you. Okay, let's talk about the crown. The crown. I've become a Charles apologist. You know, everyone had really been like rooting for her and getting out of this marriage. And I was, I was like, very young. And so not very, I was like, I don't know, middle school, something like that. I don't know. But I mean, we all were like watching this endless drama and this endless saga. And this woman was so hounded, hounded by the paparazzi. And like, in a way we have never, I have never seen since like, I guess the only thing I could compare it to is the way Britney Spears was hounded. But like, this was like beyond, like I remember on the cover of like some rag, some tabloid, it was, there had been a, a hidden camera put in the ceiling at her gym. And when she was on her back, like doing like push press ups or something, it was, it was that shot. And like, you know, your thighs are all smooshed out and everything. And she was like sweating. What kind of asshole even thinks up something like that? Why do I need to see what this woman looks like in her very 80s workout gear? It was crazy. It was just crazy. So everyone just really felt so sorry for her. And I don't think anyone felt as sorry for her though. as She felt for herself. So while a lot of what we see on the show, you know, might be dialed up for drama or like the gaps filled in in terms of conversation. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how well researched this show is. I think pretty well, right? I mean, 
I would imagine. What we do have for sure in terms of concrete data is Diana's own interviews, excerpts from the book that she contributed to, the Andrew Morton biography, the interview that she did with the BBC. God, that was a boring two fucking episodes and meeting in the car and Martin Bashir, like who fucking cares? And that lighthouse, oh brother. And there was just the constant victim narrative. There was just the constant victim narrative. And again, the show was focusing on that narrative more than it was focusing on like her work with landmine things and like AIDS patients. And I really would have liked to have seen that. I think it would have been a better balance to her because literally in the show, she just appeared like the biggest fucking whiner, the biggest fucking whiner you've ever heard. You know, and I, I was struck by one scene where it's at the end and Diana comes to her and was like, comes to Queen Elizabeth and is like, yo, I'm going to do this interview. And Elizabeth is like, why didn't you just come and talk to me about this in real time, like in the past? And she's like, um, I tried and you wouldn't see me, which according to what we saw on the show was true. Like she was getting stonewalled. And the queen was like, you think everyone is in this plot against you? Paraphrasing here. Like she shows that much emotion. She's like, we don't have... 10 minutes to think about ourselves, let alone you, and plot against you. And how can we ruin Diana's life? Literally all people wanted was for you to be happy because, and this is, you know, the obvious subtext, because that would have made their lives easier, right? And I don't know how many other Diana movies you've seen. Did you see the one with Kristen Stewart, Spencer? Oh my God. I don't know. It didn't make a lick of sense. You couldn't tell what was real and what wasn't. I, it was like phantasmagorical. And it was the same kind of vibe where the guy who was the chef or the groundskeeper, whatever the fuck he was, he's like, everyone is actually rooting for you. They really are, Diana. Like they are, they really, they don't know how to help you. They don't know what you want. What do you want? And that, to me, is the question that kind of stood out in The Crown. It's like, what do you, what did you, what do you want? And I was really surprised when in one scene she's like, I was overwhelmed with love for my husband. Were you? Like on her wedding day? I'm like, that's news to me. Like I had never gotten the impression she was that into him, that they were that into each other. Like maybe, I don't know. I. And maybe I'm, maybe I got the, the info wrong. Maybe I kind of like missed that day in Diana school. But yeah, it's like, you were into him? I thought it was just kind of this thing, like you were set up and then holy shit, it took on a life of its own. Before you know it, you were getting married. It's like, ha, that is what I, I don't know. Is that your impression of their relationship? Or were you... Because if you look at it through the lens of she was in love with him, fuck, like that's a horrible situation she was in. Like your husband's clearly in love with someone else and not really trying to hide it. And his family doesn't care. Like nobody cares that he's breaking his marriage vows again and again and icing you out and being a general bag of shit. But like I said, my impression of their relationship, like forever, like even when I was growing up, like I don't know that anyone thought they were really in love? I don't know. Tell me your thoughts, you know? But it was just kind of like, okay, so this dude you're only like sort of into isn't into you, then go have your own affair, which is literally what the royal family told her. Like, do whatever you need to do to make yourself happy, but in public, fucking show up. And here's the point of what I'm saying. This is why I'm kind of team Charles and team royal family. Because these positions, they're jobs. And this is my issue with Meghan Markle. Like, this is a job. No, it's not. Well, then what is your job? Where do you work? Tesco? Cinnabon at the airport? Where do you work? Oh, that's right. You don't pay for your housing or your health insurance um, or your car or your gas or your food. You don't pay for any of that. Who pays for that? Oh, the royal family? Then guess the fuck what? You work for them. The people putting food on your table is who you work for, whether that's your parents, your husband, who, that's what that is. And it, it, it irks me to no end to see these women, these royals, and I'm, the men, believe me, there's plenty of ungrateful royals throughout 
in who are men throughout history, not understanding the concept that nothing is for free and that some people are like legitimately very miserable and they don't get to live in a palace and they understand what their job is and their job fucking sucks, but it doesn't come with any tiaras. Okay. It doesn't come with armed guards and private yachts and it just comes with a mop bucket and clocking in and some shit ass boss. And that's what it is. And this victimhood of these women, nobody understands what I've been through. Sweetheart, you don't understand what other people go through. That's what, that's what fucks me up. Are you in a loveless marriage? That's awful. Is your husband cheating on you? Trash. But maybe look around when you're in those AIDS wards and talking to pediatric cancer patients and be like, you know what? You know what? I got breath in my body. I am strong. I am healthy. I have kids that love me. I have fans that love me. This one dude over here doesn't love me. I don't even know if I love him. Look at those ears. I have a lot to be grateful for. We certainly don't hear any gratitude from Meghan Markle. From, not just from the royal family, from anything she's experienced ever in her life. Deal or no deal? What the fuck was that about? I was just so reduced. Oh, okay. Then you, you went on to like your role in Beverly Hills 90210 where weren't you giving a blowjob in one scene? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Next after that was the Nelson Mandela biopic that they were going to cast you in as Nelson because that's who you think you are. Ugh. I just have a real issue with people who have so much and you entrench still into that victim narrative. I literally hate it. Some people have a, have a really sad song to sing. Some people have real problems. I don't know that, I mean, of course, like everyone's problems are real, but I, I just kind of became Team Charles after watching that and getting that refresher and going back and looking at Diana archives and, you know, reading some excerpts from the book. And it's like, poor me, poor me, poor me. And yeah, in so many degrees, yeah, that. For her, it wasn't, it couldn't have been easy, but the way she canonized herself as this martyr of suffering just does not sit right with me. So what do we do with a victim? What do we do with the victim? Because we talked about Meghan Markle recently and something I'm sure I mentioned in the video. It was a report that came out of the palace or part of a book, whatever it was. I feel like there's so much Markle news that all kind of like blurs together in this unpleasant slime, where it was like, before she came in, you know, before she married Harry, we, you know, we were getting ready in the palace and we were like excited and we, and we had all decided we were going to do whatever we could to like make her happy. You know, we wanted her to be happy and like, but we were already, we had already lost because we didn't realize she had decided to be unhappy. She had chosen her storyline and it was the same as Diana's, which was, I am the victim. And she thought she was going to be as popular as Diana because of that victim narrative. And people didn't understand that like a victim narrative in order for it to work is number one, very risky and very tenuous and can backfire very easily. As we see in the crown, when Diana's like three days ago, everyone loved me and now they don't. And also it has to be tempered with so much warmth and so much likability is a very tricky dynamic. It really is like this sort of magical alchemy of personality traits coming together. And Megan, you don't got them. You were too heavy handed. You fucking blew it. You finessed a prince. Great. You didn't finesse the rest of us. Sorry. You didn't finesse me and most other thinking women. Like most of us can see right through what she's doing. And I bring this up, not just because I can't stand Megan Markle and I can't. Although one of my friends is on her podcast and said that she was very nice and very gracious. So, okay, fine. I bring it up because I think doesn't that just typify the victim people? They decide to be like this. They decide to be unhappy. Whether it's tacit or overt, whether they're writing it in their daily planner, today I'm a victim. Or they just, they get in there and they're like, oh yeah, oh Ah, this feels so good. And they're getting positive feedback. You poor thing. You're like, I know, poor me. And listen, we're all allowed to wallow a little bit. You know, when you get sick and your mom's there and you're like, I want more buttered noodles. This is like, it's okay. Like we are allowed our wallow time. We are. It's just human nature and it's healthy for us because it means we're processing our emotions. But it, it's a very dangerous place to visit because you can get stuck there. It's an abyss. It's a tar pit. 
And some people are very happy to make their home in that tar pit. So how do we deal with them? Oof. It's really tough because, you know, I love to call people on their shit, right? Do I like to get called on my shit? Absolutely not. Of course, typical hypocrite. Hashtag hypocrite. <laughs> I mean, who, who does? Who's like, I love to be called out. Like, well, none of us do. None of us do. But as long as we can, you know, acknowledge that and be like, this feels icky because it sucks, but that doesn't mean what they're saying is incorrect. Okay. Calling of out a victim, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Because... I experienced this. This was last year I was on this like girls trip, right? And one of our friends got, what was it? We were in Florida and this guy at a bar said something to her, like just said something rude. Like, I think he called her like flat chested or something. And she was going to ride this shit till the wheels fell off. Like she, or he like, oh, oh, oh. I think he like grabbed her boobs like, oh, flat chested. I know it was bad. It was, it was bad. Like it was unarguably bad but she wanted to reorient literally the entire rest of the trip and it was like Greer's birthday like it was somebody else's birthday we were like we're not doing this it was someone else's birthday she wanted to reorient the whole trip to like her pain she wouldn't shut up about it she was cornering this other girl who like only was a friend of a friend she didn't know us that well so she felt like an outsider and like this chick preyed upon that I was like eh. like she's gonna get on my side and finally I was like, Meg, like, we're not doing this anymore. It happened. It sucks. We all left the bar. Like, so-and-so threw a drink on the dude. Like, we dealt with it. We're all moving on. Whoa. I was told not to tell her how to process her emotions. I was told that I am alone on thinking this, even though I knew I wasn't. And the girls were like, you know, they they didn't want to, but that's the thing. They didn't want to stick their neck out. I did. And I bore the brunt of this storm. And she really wouldn't speak to me the rest of the trip. You know what? She kind of hasn't spoken to me since. You know what's wild is I only just realized that. That's how little, okay. Yeah, like it was never really the same. Like she's she's like, cord she's nice, but yeah, huh. We've never really been that close since because I had the audacity to be like, enough is enough. Enough is enough. And you know what? I really did think about it after the fact. I'm like, was I off base? Like, she was upset about it. And maybe I disrupted her process, you know, or whatever. And like, maybe I compartmentalize things. And maybe I'm like, mm, mm, mm. and maybe I'm like the queen of denial. And when bad things happen, I just put them in a little jar and put them on a little emotional shelf and be like, goodbye. You're going to collect dust up there. I'm never going to open you and process you. I know that I have a tendency to do that. So what? I like it. I think it's more efficient. I think it's a better way, tr truly I think it's a better way to live. Do you know what PTSD is? It's too much memory. It is. It's, you're remembering, because your mind, we all know, our minds naturally slough memories. Like, do you remember everything from second grade? Of course not. Do you remember everything from last week? Also no. I don't even know what I had for breakfast today. Well, I had several breakfasts, but we are designed to like sort of trim those dead ends, right? Because if we don't, we are, we are storing too many memories and they're all too much at the forefront. And if we have to constantly relive a memory, positive or negative, we have to relive the emotion. And that can be too emotionally taxing, right? Even, even positive things. If you were reliving your wedding day or getting your puppy for the first time or whatever, all day, every day, or at these, worse than all day at every day, at these like, random intervals that you can't control, that's a lot of emotional process. That's a high neural load, right? And you would be very, very exhausted. Think of it almost like orgasms. They're great. Do I need to have 10 a day? No, I do not. No, I do not, right? You don't need them all one right after the other. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay. Little goes a long way. Same with memory. And PTSD is, is you, you aren't sloughing these things off. You're reliving them again and again and again, and your mind isn't putting them into sort of any like filing system, I guess you could say. And my mind does. Like I've been held hostage in Africa, filing system, we're good, we're processing. You know, a lot of bad shit has happened. I'm like, huh. And I, I guess I just move on a little bit better from things. You know, not everything, but a lot of stuff. And some people don't, you know? So part of me was like, fuck, like, am I 
kind of like wagging my finger at her because her emotional filing system is not as efficient, if you want to categorize it as a good thing, I do, as my own. And the conclusion I reached was no. No, I am not. <laughs> I'm actually in the right. Because look, look, I can tell the difference. I think I can tell the difference between someone who is legitimately traumatized and someone who's fucking milking it because she was doing the things like targeting Kristen's friend who was on the trip with us because she was doing the thing like no matter how much attention we were giving her it wasn't enough and she would literally say that you're not giving me enough attention about this and I'm like okay I mean you can be in pain and still be milking it like both those things can be true right you just because you're milking it doesn't mean it's you're milking something false but I was just done. I was just done with it. And I'm like, hey, like we don't need to keep bringing it up. It's Greer's birthday. We're trying to celebrate. You know, it's her 30th. It's it's a big deal. Like, let's just let's just talk about this after the trip. Okay? We'll get on the group that. <sighs> so I became public enemy number 1. Why is that inevitable when you call out a victim? Because you're feeding into their hand. You're feeding into their hand. What do they want? to feel like the victim. And if you become the villain, <laughs> this is a whole new victim narrative. She was fucking delighted. I swear to God, I could see her eyes light up when I called her out on this. Because she she acted, she's like, <gasps> but it was like, <gasps> <sighs> because she got a whole new victim song. She got a whole new script. Act two, here we go. Light up the stage, bring up the curtain. And I think part of me knew that that was gonna be the outcome. And you should know this too. Learn from my mistakes, although I don't think it's a mistake because here's the outcome. She didn't try that shit again with me. She didn't run that game with me one more time. She never brought that up again. She never brought up the incident. She didn't confront, like, she has run her victim bullshit because she has done it, I mean, oh my God. Take your pick. A different day, a different issue, uh, the boss was mean to her, the boyfriend, whatever it was. She will find the victim lane on any landscape. She will carve a victim-y path. But she doesn't do it with me. And does that mean we're not really friends anymore? Correct. Do I miss her as a friend? I mean, honestly, now that I think about it, this is going to sound harsh. I am harsh. I'm a reptile. All the good qualities she brought into my life, easily replicable. I was able to find them in other people. And actually, I mean, there's some things that like, wow, she was really, she's a great hostess. Dude, listen to me. She's a great hostess? Who cares? Who cares what kind of party she threw? Who cares? She was insufferable in this one category that to me is very triggering. Like I hate victim narratives. I hate them. Some people don't mind them. Some truly, like some people are like, it's not a big deal to me. Uh, for me, it is. It's absolutely intolerable to be around people like that. But you know, other people who you might find insane and like could gouge your eyes out, they don't really, just whatever, it doesn't really bother me. You know, we each have our own sort of like weak spots and trigger points, that's okay. So I look at her and I'm like, it doesn't matter what she brought to the table. The fact that she also brought this victim narrative, I don't want to, I don't want to be at her table. I don't want anything to do with her. I will throw the baby out with the bathwater. Bye. So look, you call out a victim. This is kind of what you have to expect. World War III. And I was lucky because this chick moved on. Like she didn't keep, I mean, you know what? Maybe she did. Maybe behind my back. She's like, and do you remember, do you remember when Shallon, blah, 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 blah. we were in Fort Lauderdale, blah, 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 blah. She probably did, but the fact that I either didn't hear about it because my friends weren't gonna pass along because they knew I was right, or I just kind of like didn't even notice that maybe she hated me. And I'm like, whatevs, doesn't that say it all? I don't even notice that you're mad at me? Bye. So that's how you can deal with a victim. Or you just stay out of their way. There's something called the gray rock method. Okay, the gray rock method is exactly what it sounds like. <gasps> You're a gray rock. You're just a gray rock. They started, and this guy, he grabbed my boob. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow. 
you are giving nothing positive. You're giving nothing negative. You are just sort of there because what these people want is engagement, right? Talk about cold blooded. A victim is always going to be the most cold blooded person out there. And if you're new here, or you haven't heard me talk about warm blooded versus cold blooded. Think about animals, a cold blooded animal, a reptile. They need heat from the environment to stay alive. They depend on the outside to keep themselves alive. Warm blooded animal, a lion, a great white shark. You know, they're warm blooded and now it's wild. That's why they're found in all the oceans. Ugh. They don't, they generate their own heat. Okay. They don't, they like the environment to be nice and hospitable, but they don't necessarily need it the way a snake or a bug needs it. Humans are the same when it comes to self-esteem and especially attention. I am a warm blooded animal. I don't live for likes, even though I'm an influencer and a lot of, a lot of influencers do a lot of non-influencers do too, you know? I don't need that outside approval. I, as much as I possibly can, try to generate it from the inside out so that I'm more bulletproof, I'm more solitary, but in a good, healthy, positive way. And therefore I can pick and choose my interactions. I don't need to go out every night to get validated by guys that I'm cute and that I'm cool. I don't need to do that. There was a time in my life that I did, but not anymore. And a victim, the coldest of bloods, because if they, if they're, they're a tree falling in the forest, if there's no one to share their victim story with, what happens to their identity, right? Who are they if there's no audience? It's a, it, they're performing a play to an empty house. So if you can be that empty house, mm-hmm, yeah. Hey, do you, um, do you know what Monet's recipe is for those wasabi mashed potatoes? If you can just be like, mm-hmm, and change the subject, they're gonna be, they're gonna be a little prickly. They're gonna be a little nettled that you're not listening. And then you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna move on. It's the economy of attention. People like that, they gotta get that heat. They gotta get it. They're dying inside, man. So they gotta get the heat, they gotta get that audience, and they're gonna move on. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go like get another drink. And they're gonna move on and they're gonna tell that victim story to somebody else. They're gonna run that game on somebody else. I realized this um, in when I moved to Montana. There was a girl who was always down to meet my friends who were coming to visit. Like, oh my God, yes, I want to meet Sarah and Kelly and Katie and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, wow, like, she's just so welcoming to all my friends. No, <laughs> that's not what it was. What it actually was is she had just broken up with her boyfriend because he had cheated on her. And every new person was fresh meat that she could start her victim story over from scratch. What she had failed to mention in this story was that the reason this dude dumped her wasn't because he was cheating, he was, but because she slept with his brother. You know, it was just, she didn't want to say that. She wanted to like tell this victim story where she was the, you know, oh, I just got cheated on. It's like, girl, like you were, you were sleeping with the dude's brother. So again, like the economy of attention and a lot of people, a lot of victim people dress up that cold blooded need as something seemingly very positive. Oh, I would love to meet your friends. Bring them over for wine. That's so sweet. She wants to meet all the people I love most in the world. No, she wants an audience. Big difference. And now I'm, you know what's funny? I'm just making this connection. The chick I was talking about in Florida, I was like, she's a great host because that's an audience. Isn't that crazy? Because now that I'm thinking about it, when we would go over to her house, she would open red wine and put on Taylor Swift, put on folklore and cry. And we would have to listen to whatever was going on in her life. But she would have really nice champagne and like little catered appetizers and little crafts for us to do. And I was like, wow, this is fun. And I couldn't, I'm literally realizing this in real time. I couldn't think why I was always so tired and depleted. Cause I'm like, that was a great party. And I thought, oh, I just, it was, I'm tired cause it was a party and parties are tiring. No, it's because I was in the audience of the saddest play in the fucking world and I couldn't leave. And I didn't even buy tickets and I didn't want to be here. I thought I was going to a rave. I'm at a sad monologue and there is wine. Huh. So look around your life. Look at who needs audiences. It might not look the way you think. Maybe mom wants you over every Sunday for dinner, not because she just wants to see you, but because she needs to vent about her week and entrench in some victim narrative. 
Maybe that book club is actually someone venting their political issues and why they think they're a victim in America. I mean, think about it. You know what that is? It's a line from Getting My Highlights. Okay. Because I know someone's going to be like, your, your contour is not blended. I'm not wearing contour. My bangs are too, aha, uh-huh. looks like a wig. You know how my bangs are my constant enemy. Now I want to switch gears. Didn't mean to talk about victim narratives that long, but why not? To being the hero. Being the hero. So look, you guys have been asking me to cover the Love is Blind season three. I literally don't think I can do it. Please don't make me do this. I love you. Please. I ask so little. Please don't make me watch this season. I don't know why. I just don't have it in me. We just got done dealing with the other Love is Blind, right? I mean, we just wrapped that up and now here we come. But everyone's like Zanab and Cole, right? Is that is that who I'm thinking of, Zanab? Is, am I saying it right? I don't even know. But from the little that I've seen, and tell, I, I don't have to tell you to tell me if I'm wrong. You'll tell me. It seems like those two were just chirping and nipping at each other at all times. Is that right? That's shades of Charles and Diana. Now I want to talk about the concept of being the hero because it stood out to me in this season of The Crown, like in the episode where Charles and Diana are trying to negotiate their divorce with poor Johnny Lee Miller, aka whatever the prime minister who's supposed to be, story. I don't know. I'm an American. We have a horrible education system. I know nothing about other countries was trying to like broker a peace or not a peace, but just a, a negotiate, a resolution for the divorce settlement between these two. And she's like, he said to Diana, like, you know, I just, I would encourage you to be flexible. And she's like, flexible. Charles is the most inflexible man on the planet. And it just, it reminded me of how we all get when we're hurt and we're in a fight where it's just, no one is letting go. We are like two dogs, on the ends of a rope, right? Back and forth and back and forth. And Dr. Phil once said something that I go back to a lot. I mean, I try to. Do I follow it? With mixed results. Somebody's got to be the hero. Because he would have these couples on his show and they'd be fighting. You did this. You did it. And they both had valid points. And that's the worst part. When there's hurt on both sides, there's betrayal, there's trust, whatever on both sides. And no one is giving in. It's like you are locked into your position, your victim narrative, righteous though it might be, it's still a victim narrative. And you are not going to concede a motherfucking inch. And that's when Dr. Phil is like, so one of you has to step up and be the hero. Who's it going to be? And I love that he phrased it like that versus one of you is going to have to back off and back down. That's a, that's a loser position, right? That's loser mentality. That's loser rhetoric. Dr. Phil spun it as winner rhetoric. You're not backing down. You're stepping up. You're being the hero here. And it's not even this bullshit like take the high road. Fuck the high road if it's a cover for cowardice. Fuck you and your fucking high road, okay? The hero rhetoric is so much more powerful and so much more clever, which is why I love Dr. Phil, because who doesn't want to feel like the hero? Because what's the opposite of a hero? A villain, isn't it? And so whoever steps up first, well, I'm the hero. It automatically makes that other person the villain, which is very satisfying to the person who steps it up, right? So if we can like kind of think about it from that angle, oh, Dr. Phil, you're so clever, but also, This is going to incentivize us to when we're locked in this combat and you're fighting and it's 2 a.m. and you're hurling these accusations instead of being like, I'm going to be the weakling and be like, fine, I'm going to bed. No, you're going to say, hold on. If I really think he's wrong and it's really, fuck you, Jeff, what can I do worse to him? What's going to be worse for him than feeling like the shitbird? Then looking at me being this pillar of maturity, this hero. Because then, you know what you can do if you're like, you know what, Jeff? I think we're going to go to bed. I'm actually going to get an Uber. I'm going to go home and we can speak about this at a better time. And Jeff can say, ah, I knew it. See, pussy, you're backing down. I knew it. You didn't even have a comeback to that. You're going to hold tight. You're going to be like, no, I'm the hero here. I'm the hero here. 
Because look, one of two things are going to happen. Either the Jeff, Jeff, is going to be like, you're right. We're not getting anywhere. This is devolving. We're both saying things we don't mean. Okay. And then that's going to give you both the clarity and the data to be like, this person maybe does really want to work this out. And they're acknowledging, hey, we need some strategic retreat right now. These fucking bangs. Oh, they just look dumber. What is, is that better? I don't even know. Oh, no. Ah! <sighs> or Jeff is going to go, ha! You don't have anything to say. That's what I fucking thought. And someone like that doesn't change. They're not acting like that because it's two in the morning. They're not acting like that because they're drunk. They're not even acting like that because they're legitimately right. They're acting like that because they're an asshole. That's why. And that will become clearer and clearer to you and to everybody else the more you take the hero position. Taking the hero position, again, is not about the high road because fuck your fucking high road. You want to start a fight with me? Guess what? I'm coming down to the gutter with you and I'm going to slit your throat. So don't try it. The hero perspective is nothing more than strategy. It's a way to get everyone on your side by doing less. Instead of running around a book club, and do you know what he did? Do you know? You're like, you can say, someone had to be the hero in that situation that night. And I decided it was going to be me. I don't want to be down there in the trenches with him anymore. If he wants to scream and rage and foam at the mouth, he can do it. He can do it in a vacuum. I'm not going to be there. I went home. And people are going to be like, good for her. Good. That must have been hard, right? I couldn't do that. No, I just stay up and I fight with Dennis. I don't fuck him, right? If you can establish yourself like that, Jeff is going to try to go for blood. He is going to want, if he's an asshole, you know, if he's, if he's a collaborative person, he's going to be like, okay, that was smart. Like, let's, let's talk about this in a more neutral time, okay? If he's not, he's going to keep trying to provoke you and he's going to throw bigger and bigger rocks at your doorstep, so to speak, right? Because he wants engagement. Wait a minute. Where have we heard this before? Cold-blooded victim narrative. They need an audience. They need it. They need the economy of attention. So if he's not giving it to you, what? You're not going to answer? He's texting you crazier and crazier things, trying to bait you, try to provoke you. You're not saying nothing. You're the hero. You're the grand high Roman hero with your roughly feather headdress thing. You know, that like, it's like horse hair. What is that? Seems very heavy and like it would flop over. Anyway, you're not taking the bait. And so the economy of attention, which is an, as immutable of a law as gravity itself, <laughs> means he's gonna be like, fine. He's gonna go to everyone you know. He's gonna take it to the streets and be posting on Instagram. And what is going to happen? All of public opinion is gonna turn against him. Where have we seen that? Princess Diana, right? In the crown. The, the whole plot, the whole up and down of the plot was the public being so in her corner and the more she talked, the more she buried herself or from a PR standpoint. Whereas Charles gave one interview in out, said nothing else, never spoke on it again, it's done. She was like this and that and the biography and this, and like she wouldn't shut up about it. And that worked against her. It worked against her. Because I do believe on some level, all of us do know that just like Queen Elizabeth said, Non-reaction is the hardest thing in the world. Non-reaction. What is it, the Oscar Wilde quote? It's better to keep your mouth shut and have people think you're a fool than to open it and leave no doubt. <laughs> Basically, if you talk a lot, people are going to know you're dumb. But if you keep quiet, uh, they're not going to know. And things just kind of, things blow over. So this is an excellent strategy to be aware of and use it against your enemies or your opponents. But... I want to know what you guys have to say about this. Tell me your thoughts on The Crown this season. Tell me your thoughts on Diana versus Charles. You know, like, do you look at her as a whiner who couldn't do her job? I mean, who's happy at their job all the time? And yeah, I'm sorry that your family and your husband is, in, is intertwined with your job duties. I think a lot of people experience that. Do they get to live in a palace? No, they don't. So again, little little contrast and context and gratitude, I think would be good in all of these situations, you know? 
Tell me what you think about Princess Diana. Tell me what you think about victims in your life. Who, who has been the biggest consummate victim in your life and how do you deal with them? Have you called them out? What happened? Let's share. Let's get, uh, we're going to talk about it. And thank you again to Established Titles for supporting and sponsoring today's video.